pleasure to welcome everyone to this discussion organized by the Counter Extremism Project uh, and GlobeSec on the Muslim Brotherhood's presence and activities in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, my name is David Ibsen. I'm the Executive Director of CEP. And if you'll indulge me, just a brief word about uh, uh, the Counter Extremism Project with apologies to those that may already be uh, familiar. Uh, CEP is a transatlantic uh, research and advocacy organization. Uh, it focuses on uh, disrupting the activities of terrorist or, uh, and extremist groups across the spectrum, uh, from the extreme right wing on one hand to Islamist terrorism on the other. Um, we've developed a particular expertise on the activities of extremists online, that is how they leverage and misuse um, the internet and social media services to recruit, um, incite, and propagandize. Uh, we also focus on disrupting the financial networks of terrorist organizations. Uh, in addition, CEP works on the broader issues of counterviolent extreme or uh, CVE and PVE, uh, including most recently and most specifically with a focus on the reintegration and rehabilitation of convicted terror terrorist offenders. In all these areas, of course, uh, CEP supports the development of uh, laws and regulations, but particularly in the areas of combating terror financing and uh, smart regulation on, on the internet. Uh, the Counter Extremism Project um, very happily um, maintains a presence not just in the U.S. but in Brussels and Berlin. Uh, in addition to in addition to our New York uh, headquarters, and I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Hans Schindler, Marco McCory from our Berlin office uh, for their work in facilitating the completion of this study uh, and today's event uh, specifically. And then, of course, I also want to extend thanks and deep appreciation to our good friends and partners at GlobeSec, particularly Casper, Victor, and their colleagues. Uh, for this joint initiative on the Brotherhood and the CEE, uh, and also for the extremely productive and rewarding cooperation that we have long enjoyed um, on other projects, including a multi-volume study exploring the progression um, or pathways of radicalization of European jihadis that was recently completed in 20, 2019. So again, thank you all for coming. Thank you for the participants. We're looking forward to this uh, discussion. It's a pleasure to hand off to my friend and, and good colleague, Casper Rekowick, to provide an introduction uh, to GlobeSec and also background on uh, the study we're discussing today. Thanks. Thank you, David. Uh, it's also my pleasure to, to, to be at this, at this seminar and to work with you uh, on, this, on this very project. Uh, as you said, the cooperation between, uh, between CEP and Globsec stretches back a, a good few years now. And uh, let, me just, let me just briefly introduce this. So essentially, uh, this is not the first time we're, we're looking into, you know, we're working on something together. As you mentioned, as David mentioned in 2019, Globsec, which is a think tank in, in Slovakia in Central Europe, and I'll get to the Central Eastern uh, Europe uh, thing that is in the topic of the seminar, which is quite, quite, quite key, I would say crucial to this. Globsec is a think tank in Bratislava, Slovakia, right at the heart, uh, I would say, of the, of, the, of the continent, and has been successfully working with CEP on issues devoted to, as David mentioned, pathways into, into, into radicalism, pathways into terrorism. We completed that study in 20, 2019. Please do check it out uh, either on, on CEP's or, or GlobSec's website. So obviously that's that's one one leg and one part of the of the of the cooperation. The other element of that is the project that we're we're progressing with now. You know, some time ago we've been musing about this and the fact that the organization such as the Muslim Brotherhood uh, is quite you know studied and we have a, you know a great expert as a commentator on this on this very on this very panel speaking, Martin Frampton, who actually has got a fantastic book out on the on, on the brothers. Is, is very much studied if it is studied in Western, in, in Western Europe. Whereas it is not so much known and very little about this and not only about the Muslim Brotherhood, but also the other revivalist Islamist movements is known in the other parts of Europe. By these other parts of Europe, you know, I'll briefly say what we mean. We will be using the term, and I'm sure Victor and Agdunas will be using the term Central Eastern Europe or Central Europe in a way. At the same time, you know, this is a very, very, very broad term. And I think, you know, there's a lot of people here in the, in the audience who might be a bit confused because usually the division is between West and East. It's not the division we like, I would say, as, as you know, the one, the, the three people speaking kind of on behalf of Globsec. Uh, are all, you know, you, maybe some would call them Eastern Europeans, some are Central Europeans, but let me just get to the specifics. So anything that is south of Stockholm, east of Berlin, southwest of Tallinn, yet at the same time north of Athens, this is what you're looking at. And yes, most of it, or a massive amount of it, if not all, has kind of a post-communist trajectory. So it used to be, it used to be communist. This is the region that we're looking at. Now, it is both Central Europe, it is, a both, it is both Eastern Europe to some extent, but it's also Southern Europe. You know, quite some of the cases that we're going to be looking at in terms of the Muslim Brotherhood presence 
are actually in a region that's often called Western Balkans, and people don't like it being called Western Balkans. They prefer, West, they prefer Southern Europe. So for this, we settled on the CEE. So whenever Victor, uh, who's the lead on, the, on this project on the Globsec side, and Ekdunas, uh, Professor Ekdunas Radzius, who's not only a professor, but also a guy who probably knows each and every Muslim living in that very, you know, uh, square that I just outlined to you, whenever they'd be saying CEE, Please do think about this shape. You know, Berlin, Stockholm, Tallinn, uh, Athens. This is the easiest. You know, this is the easiest thing. You cannot really do it on the, you know, uh, travel around all these cities on the train, since there is a bit of a sea in between. But you know, you can always, you can always try all sorts of transport. So this is essentially the, what we're looking at. And as I said, the main kind of hook on which, I mean, there are many other hooks, but the one that we're we're hanging this on, very little is known about this region in terms of like you know, presence of revivalist Islamist movements, not only brotherhood. Not so much is written. Not so much is written about Muslims in this region. But hopefully, we've got you know. Thankfully, we've got Ekdunas with us, and he actually has a few books uh, behind his belt on this very issue. And as I said, knows this region and knows the Muslims here in and out. The trajectory of the Muslim communities, and I stress communities in each and every country. There's going to be communities. There's never going to be just one. Is very different from the ones you see in Western Europe, as you have basically four types of communities. And I'll you know this is going to be my last point to kind of introduce. Uh, the situation in this region. You've got four types, if not more, of communities in the region. You've got something that is probably, I would say, lacking in Western Europe. You've got basically historically present communities, almost local communities, I would say indigenous, uh, which have been present here for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years in an uninterrupted fashion, let's say. You've got communities which are which are basically uh, composing of expats, which arrived after, especially 1989. You do have to remember that before 1989, presence of revivalist movements in this part of Europe, let's just say it was hard under the pro-Soviet dictatorships of the region. It would be pretty hard for any revivalist, you know, Islamist movement to actually take root in that very, in that very, in that very part of Europe. You've got a community of converts. And you've got a community of, you know, there were Muslims or technically Muslims arriving from, uh, from into this part of Europe before 1989, but they had not been Islamists. They were, as our report that's going to be put out on this, on this very, on this very, on this very issue stresses, they had been exchange students and they were mostly coming from autocratic, left-leaning anti-imperialist, uh, anti-imperialist countries, so to speak, in the broader Middle East and North, North Africa. They were, in a way, one of the, they compose now one of the, or their daughters and, and sons, they compose one of the, one of the communities, communities of the region. But I'll hand over uh, to the experts on the matter. Thank you again for being with us. Very grateful for CEP for, for, for uh, supporting us in this, in, this very, in this very effort. And stay tuned for more news on the, on the development of the project, which is an ongoing thing. This is way more than just this seminar and way more than just the upcoming report. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kasper. Thank you very much, David. Um, my name is uh, hans of Schindler. I'm the Senior Director of CEP and the moderator for today's event. I really am very grateful for all of you who join us today, especially the ones uh, in the United States who on Memorial Day morning take their time uh, to, to join this webinar. I promise it's going to be a very, very interesting um, uh, webinar and discussion that we have today. I, I have a couple of initial technical remarks. Some of you are, uh, I see already familiar with the uh, Zoom platform, others may not. Therefore, uh, just an explanation. This is the webinar form. It's the more secure way that Zoom allows uh, meetings with a, a great number of participants. Um, therefore, all your microphones and cameras are automatically disabled. But we don't want you to be silent uh, 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 during this discussion you can use uh, uh, the Q&A function or the F&A function if you join us from Germany. The way you find this is if you go with your cursor down on your screen, you will see a, uh, a row of little buttons and the one to the right uh, where it says Q&A, F&A, that's the one you need to press. Now, we encourage you to ask questions at any point during the seminar, uh, during that Q&A fu uh, function. There are two ways you can do this. Number one, you can just type in your question uh, and it will appear with the name that you logged in with at Zoom. You can also choose, and please feel free to do so, it's absolutely perfectly fine with us, um, choose to go anonymous and then the question will just po pop up as a question from the participants. Both uh, are fine with us. Um, we will record today's presentations 
but only the presentations, i.e. whenever one of the experts speaks and you see slides, then a recording is going on. We will not record the Q&A sections, and I'll get to that when they come in a second. Um, these will be under Chatham House rules. Uh, just as a reminder to everyone, Chatham House rules mean please engage publicly that this ha webinar happened. Please uh, also on social media, you know, say that you liked it, hopefully, but you cannot in, uh, attribute any particular statement made or any question ans asked or answered in the Q&A section to any particular individual. Um, just as a, as a, small, a small reminder. Um, we will have four presentations today. We will start with, uh, and I will introduce all of the speakers in turn. We'll start with Annelies Pauls, followed by Professor Dr. Iktunas Ratschus, um, Victor Such, and Dr. Martin Frampton, all in turn. I hope I didn't murder all of those names. Um, after each one of the presentations, we're going to have a five-minute Q&A section where there's an opportunity in if there's a transmission problem or you just didn't understand a technical point in the presentation or a particular detail to ask those questions. All of the more general discussion questions I will reserve, they will not get lost, the Q&A uh, window uh, will not delete answers. Uh, I will reserve those for the end of the webinar where we have about 30 minutes for the general discussion. Um, please, when you do ask a question in the Q&A, it helps me and the presenters a lot if you indicate who you ask the question to, any particular presenter, any particular two or three presenters or all of them, uh, so that I can then group those questions accordingly. Um, that's all for the technical the remarks that I have at the beginning. And now I have the great pleasure to introduce our good friend and colleague, Annelies Pauls. Uh, for her keynote address. Annelies is currently a research fellow at the Flemish Peace Institute. And until last year, she was an associate analyst as, at EUISS, many of you I'm sure you know, the big think tank, um, where she focused on the external dimensions of the EU justice and home affairs. Her research covered counterterrorism, counter radicalization and migration. Prior to joining the EUISS, she worked at the UN. Um, on crime prevention and criminal justice. So great experience, both looking at radicalization, counter-radicalization, as well as state reactions. Annelies holds an MA in international intercultural mediation with a specialization in Arabic and Russian and an LLM in international criminal law. So perfectly suited and prepared for the keynote address. Annelies, over to you. I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I will try to first uh, open my presentation. I hope this is all visible to everybody. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. I'm Annelies Powells. Um, I'm a, a research fellow at the Flemish Peace Institute, which is based in Brussels. And I uh, conduct research for their program on conflict and violence in society. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Globsec and CEP for organizing this conference and for inviting me to speak. Um, now, the conference, as you already understood, is about uh, the Muslim Brotherhood's activities in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, and as Kasper told in the beginning, uh, that uh, this is quite a relatively understudied phenomenon in the region there. I, in my presentation, I will focus on uh, the same activities, but in uh, Western Europe, where this is not at all a, a new phenomenon. And I hope with my presentation to bring some uh, insights for the discussion uh, later on. Um, at first, I'll give a brief overview of uh, my presentation on what I will actually talk about. First, I'll start by locating political Islam in the wider context of European Islam. And then I'll say some words about the strategy, uh, the methods and activities of groups like the Muslim Brotherhood in Western Europe. I'll also say a word about uh, the difficulties that we encounter in uh, making an accurate threat analysis of these groups and the responses by Western European governments to counter these groups. Uh, I'll conclude then by saying some words on uh, what we can expect in the near future uh, with regards to this phenomenon. Um, before I start, I think it's very necessary to say that political Islamists uh, make, a very, make up a very small proportion of European Muslims. Um, and as before has already been said, there is no such thing as one Muslim community in Europe that doesn't exist as Muslims are um, are very divided on a variety of issues, including on the religious observance. 
Now, it's very difficult to obtain exact figures on the religious views of Muslims in Europe, uh, but we do can make uh, some rough estimates. So we know that um, almost 6% of the population in Western Europe is Muslim and that the overwhelming majority of these people actually identify as a cultural Muslim or adopt to a moderate, uh, um, adopt a moderate interpretation of Islam. On the other side of the spectrum, we find uh, Muslims that adhere to a more conservative uh, version of the religion. And this can either be applied uh, exclusively to uh, their personal sphere of life or as is the case with political Islamists, they promote the application of Islamic principles to all aspects of life. Um, political Islamism Europe uh, is a very heterogeneous team uh, as uh, groups apply different methods and different discourses to promote uh, political Islam. A first distinction that we can make is based on the use of or not of violence um, in order to promote these goals. Uh, those that do make use of violence are what we call generally jihadists or Islamist terrorists. The non-violent group on the other side uh, can be divided in, in uh, two different groups. Uh, on the first, on the one hand, we have uh, Salafists, which can generally are uh, more reluctant to participate in the wider society. Whereas the group that we will study today, uh, groups like Muslim Brotherhood, Mili Gorush, are very much actually focused on participating to society. And this is uh, why scholars have uh, before me um, referred to them as Islamist uh, participationists. And I, I think this is the term that I will use also in my, my presentation. Now, while generally jihadists receive quite a lot of uh, attention uh, because of their violence, uh, Salafists also quite regularly become a, a point of attention in the media because they either adopt a, um, what we can say provocative attitudes or make provocative statements. It's very different for the groups that we study today, uh, which generally receive a lot, uh, a lot less um, attention by the media. Now, let's take a closer look at how uh, these participationist organizations actually operate. Um, the first thing that is important to say is that they operate according to a, an elaborated strategy that is focused on a two-faced approach. And I personally like very much the term that the Dutch security services use uh, in order to refer to these, uh, these movements. They use the term uh, facade politics. Um, and so this clearly um, says what, what their, their strategy is. So openly these groups uh, demonstrate to be moderate, they reject ext extremism, uh, they promote uh, participation in democracy, in democratic processes, they adhere to uh, the democratic principles, but uh, they also have a hidden agenda which is focused on promoting their orthodox uh, um, vision of Islam among uh, Muslim communities. A second characteristic is that they're highly professionalized and they operate through sophisticated and extended um, networks, which are often embedded in various fields of society. They also have a significant financial capacity, uh, which is uh, mainly um, a result of extensive funding from abo abroad, often from the Gulf countries. Um, and when we take a closer look at individuals that are involved in these movements, we see that they often have a very high level of education. They very well speak the language also of the country that they either live in or have been born in. And uh, interestingly as well, they have a, they're quite familiar with the justice system. This is important because these movements often uh, prefer to operate uh, in the gray zones that are there between legality and illegality. Now, one of the main difficulties uh, in dealing with participationist organizations is uh, setting up an accurate analysis of the threat that they pose. This is mainly due to their double speak. Um, so there is often uh, quite some discussions and debates about how successful these groups actually are in advancing uh, their goal of, uh, of political Islam. Uh, they themselves often promote themselves as being the representatives of European Muslims. Yet, we know that overstating their importance is also a quite important part of their strategy. And as we have seen uh, in the first slide, um, these views uh, that they hold are not widely shared among European Muslims. Nevertheless, it must be said that they do exert a strong influence on Muslim communities in Europe. 
And this is because they dispose of extended networks uh, and financial capabilities also. And this makes that their interpretation of Islam is often the most accessible, uh, either through the many publications that they make, uh, through the vast network of imams and networks that they hold, or charities and events that they organize. Um, now, participationist organizations also exert a significant influence on the political scene, uh, both at the national and the European level, which is sometimes a bit overlooked. Um, and I do so mainly because of their extensive uh, political activism. So in, in various occasions, we have seen that they managed to act as the prin principal interlocutors uh, on issues related to Islam, both at, um, both at the national level, but also with the European authorities. And the main fears that are obviously uh, linked to this, uh, the rise of Islamism is the fact that they, they could cause uh, a reversal of the integration process of, of uh, Muslim communities in Europe, but also that their exclusionary politics could actually uh, increase polarization among wider society. So how do um, European governments uh, in, Western government, in Western Europe uh, actually uh, respond to these movements? Um, first, it needs to be said that there is no clear and coherent strategy, often uh, within countries themselves, but also between countries in Western Europe. Um, in general, we can say that there has been attitude uh, changement over time. Um, previously, European governments often accepted uh, these movements as representatives of Muslim community, and there are several reasons why uh, they did that. One of the main reasons is that um, they seemed, these groups seemed a better alternative uh, to uh, religious represent, representative groups uh, that were put forward by governments of uh, the country of origin of, of many of the, the migrants that lived in Western Europe. And these uh, that we usually call uh, embassy Islams. Uh, so the European governments at a certain point wanted something that was seen as more European, more internal. Um, and also, obviously, that the Western governments had uh, often a suf insufficient knowledge of uh, their migrant communities, but also of these, these political movements and what they actually represented or what they wanted to, to obtain. Now, we see um, a tendency towards a more a restrictive um, attitude, a more restrictive posture towards these participa participationist uh, organizations. And the trend towards distrust of these groups is a direct result of, uh, of both internal and external developments within the EU. Internally, obviously, um, a reason is uh, the, the terrorist attacks, uh, in particular the ones from 2015 and 2016 in Brussels and Paris, which created a fear that uh, participationists um, would not only uh, be able to polarize society at large, but actually could also lead to the radicalization of individuals specifically. Externally, then, there are developments that occurred in the southern Medi Mediterranean uh, following the uprisings in 2011. And in particular, fear for the rise of Islamism in countries that were either seen as beacons of, of democracy, like T Tunisia, uh, or uh, countries uh, that were known for uh, religious diversity, such as uh, Egypt. Now we see, so as I said, we see uh, a, a more uh, a restrictive posture towards these movements. Uh, the governments in Western Europe adopt uh, different, re different reactions to this movement, but there is a generally a twofold uh, tendency. First, there is a tendency uh, to uh, put pressure on, on Islamist movements, and this can be done either by banning them, um, limiting their funding uh, that comes from abroad, uh, expelling radical imams that are linked to them, closing Islamic schools uh, that adhere to uh, conservative uh, views. And on the other hand, there also is a more uh, an upside movement uh, aimed at trying to take control of Islam. Uh, for instance, by, by providing training for imams, uh, by regulating and financing mosques, and also by, by providing a space for uh, religious uh, activities in public entities. Um, now, then I come to my last slide. Um, so I wanted to say something about uh, what we can expect in the near future uh, from these movements and from these developments that I just mentioned. Um, so when we talk about the future, uh, we think about youth as the future is mostly developed, is, is strongly dependent on, on young people. 
And unfortunately, studies have shown that uh, many, young young, many young Muslims in Western Europe, often of second or third or even fourth generation, are struggling to find their place in Western society. They often feel also less connected to the country that they live in or that they were born in. And uh, as most uh, youngsters, um, they're searching for an identity. And in many cases, this can become a search for a religious identity. And when they do search for this religious identity, they often search online. And um, often they fall, uh, as I mentioned before, on the, the most likely to find um, ideologies or interpretations that are linked to Islamist uh, participationist groups. And uh, contrary to restrictions that I mentioned before that have been put in place uh, to, um, uh, with a focus on offline spheres, uh, online approaches can unfortunately only be uh, targeted through a, more, through a coherent but also a coordinated approach between EU member states, which we currently see is missing. Now, a second perspective for the future um, is linked to the reciprocity between Islamism and far right. Now, these two are highly interconnected. Uh, the rise of Islamism among uh, Muslim communities is used uh, by the far right in their narratives and it, it confirms their narratives that are based on uh, fear and danger of um, an Islamic conquest. Uh, and so this rise of Islam and Islamism can actually uh, increase the appeal of far right uh, groups. Vice versa, the situation is actually quite similar as the rise of the far right uh, uh, confirms ideas among uh, some Muslim communities that they are actually not wanted or that they're not part of society or they feel as if they were second uh, class uh, citizens. And so this uh, has a risk that they, um, this might promote their search uh, for a, a group based ideology or a religious ideology and risks turning them even further into inward into their own community. Um, now where we see an, an increase in restrictions focused on uh, Islamist uh, groups, we actually uh, see that ideas and groups linked to the far right are more and more becoming accepted by mainstream society. So the risk of such an inconsistent approach uh, can either lead, maybe be perceived as uh, something that is upholding a, a double standard, but I think it also can lead to um, making the restrictions that I mentioned before on, on Islamism actually quite ineffective. Um, now I will conclude my presentation here. Um, what I think we can conclude from these last two points is uh, that on the one hand, a focus on restricting Islamist uh, movements in Western Europe is quite necessary as they are uh, most likely uh, to have an influence on Muslim communities, but also um, at, the same at the same time, I think that the points that I mentioned also demonstrate that the restrictions need to be complemented by something uh, more comprehensive. Uh, it also takes into account uh, grievances that are underlying the reasons why people actually feel attracted to these movements, both from the far right as from Islamism movements. So I will end my presentation here. Um, thank you for your attention and um, I'd be happy to dig a bit deeper into all of, in some of these points uh, in the Q&A. Thank you so much, Annelies. I really appreciate this was a great scene set uh, talking about the Islamist participa uh, participationist organizations. Very nice term. I, I like that one. And their, their strategies and facade politics and hidden agenda, which makes it more um, difficult, uh, coupled with their professional and financial capacity, makes it more difficult to actually identify them and uh, uh, take appropriate countermeasures. Thank you very much for mentioning the European approach on the a common approach on the online sphere. This is something that also is very dear to the heart of CP. I really appreciate that. And of course, the interplay between Islamists and, and, and right-wing radicals uh, in Europe, but not only in Europe. Um, there are, please, uh, some of you have already asked some questions. I, I would like to encourage everyone else. The Q&A window is down at the bottom of your screen. If you go down with your cursor, you click on it then you can answer the questions. Um, we've, we've got only a couple uh, um, so far. Annalise, I'll, I'll ask uh, the most detailed ones and then postpone the other ones for the discussion later. One uh, uh, set on your point, um, they operate in a gray zone, these, these organizations, between legality and illegality. What part of what the Muslim Brotherhood groups in the Western Europe do is actually illegal?
let me find my uh, microphone again. Um, <clears throat> yes, yeah, so as I mentioned, uh, there is often, uh, um, well, I think with, with legal and illegal activities, some of the illegal activities um, that have come uh, above uh, in the last years actually uh, are more linked to the financial aspect. So more about the money laundering, fraud, uh, these kind of aspects. But what I mentioned, what I want to point out more is, is the fact about uh, the boundaries between what is actually accepted in a democratic society in terms of uh, freedom of speech. So the boundaries there are not quite clear always. So that, there is a vote of a double, double approach there. So on one hand, very illegal activities, more on the financial aspects, but also um, gray zones with regards to uh, democratic principles. Fantastic. Mark Thomas asks um, about an organization that is actually banned as a terrorist organization in Germany. Uh, it's called the True Religion Project Read in Europe. Um, could you comment on that? Uh, how prevalent is it and how influential is it? And is it really part of the participationist group or is it more of the uh, uh, terrorist uh, provision? Um, I, I, I'm, I, I wouldn't want to uh, really go deeper into that organization. I haven't really focused on that in my research. Um, now, what I want to say is that there are often quite uh, a lot of links that are, you know, the, the distinctions that I make and that others have made before me are not so black and white. So there are quite a lot of links that, that go from one group to another. Um, either they are, the links are personal, uh, financial, financial um, supportive links as well. So the boundaries are also not very clear. Um, which is also the same, actually, if you look at the far right, uh, there is also, it's very complicated to make a distinction that is the same in each country and for each group. So there are quite a lot of links, but I do, wouldn't want to go much deeper into the organization specifically. Fantastic. And then last, uh, before we move on to the next speaker, a group of questions always focus, uh, focusing on the recruitment. So, you know, what indicators are there? Uh, in Muslim communities, what particular actions do they take? Are they targeting youth? And how do they target youth? Are there any particular profiles they're looking for in the Muslim community? Um, well, here I can say something about the research project that I conducted very recently. And that was focused on um, Muslim youth in Brussels specifically. Um, and this is something that I mentioned as the last point, uh, the last in the last slide as well about uh, future perspectives on youth. So youth is very much targeted, both by Islamist groups as by jihadist groups. And one of the main um, pitching points for recruiters is actually religion, and it it can happen on a very very uh, light manner. So it's it's often really uh, youngsters that are just posing very, very innocent questions on the internet because the internet is something that for them, it gives all the possibilities. They often don't know who to ask these religious questions to in their immediate environment. They don't feel comfortable asking them to parents or, or, or an imam or, so, or a school teacher. So they go on the internet with very, very simple questions. And it's just that they fall on this ideology that is very, uh, radical and and it, it becomes also quite gradual so it, it really is something that it's an interactive process of tar recruiters targeting youngsters that are looking for religious answers um, and it's a mixture also of online and on off, offline and online actually interaction so it's really a, a process of, of gaining trust um, being there for them so it, it's very very um, a strong uh, interactive process actually. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Annelies. Um, that was a great scene setter. Um, to all of those uh, whose questions are still open, we'll have them in the Q&A session. We'll try to get them during the general discussion. But I would like to now move on to, to our good colleague, Professor Dr. Etunash Ratius, uh, uh, who is uh, a professor of Middle Eastern and Islamic Studies at uh, Vianautas Magnus University in Lithuania. He also re, uh, is uh, the reviews editor of the Journal of Muslims in Europe and co-editor of the Yearbook of Muslims in Europe. So great uh, a researcher in that regard. Uh, his research interests encompass Eastern uh, European Muslim communities and governance and of religion, particularly Islam in post-communist Europe. So exactly the area, the, the, uh, the geographic area where we look. He is also the co-editor of Islam, Leadership in the European Lands of the Former Ottoman and Russian Empires, Legacy, Challenges, Challenges and Change, and the author of Muslims in Eastern Europe, 
uh, as well as Islam in post-communist Eastern Europe between uh, churchification and secular securitization. He really did this title just so that I slip up. Um, from the European perspective, uh, he's also the Lithuanian leader of the Horizon 2020 project. As many of you know, it's a massive EU project on, on research, um, and focusing on radicalization, secularism, and the governance of religion, bringing together Europe and Asian perspectives. Um, therefore, he is the perfect presenter for leaving the Eastern uh, European, uh, the Western European part, and now going towards the area of the triangle um, that uh, Kasper described so nice in his little geography lesson at the beginning. So, um, Ektunas, please, the floor is yours. Thanks, Hans. Uh, let me also uh, share my slides with you so that it is a bit easy and maybe more interesting to follow than just listen to me or just watch my face, which is probably not very impressive, I suppose. Uh, yes, I will be focusing on uh, Eastern Europe, as opposed to what Annalise was talking about, Western Europe, although in her presentation she would not refer as often uh, to any sort of area within Europe, she'd talk in general about Europe. But I feel there's a, well, not one, actually, a number of distinctions between these two regions uh, that we have grown to uh, understand within Europe, I mean, Western and Eastern Europe. And uh, unlike Kasper, who would probably want me to add Central and Eastern Europe, I'll stick to Eastern Europe just so that we save words. But of course, by saying Eastern Europe, I include Central Europe, geographically speaking. And when I say Eastern Europe, I mean uh, the two dozen uh, post-communist uh, countries in this part of Europe. So I'll be focusing on what I call Islamic revivalism. Um, the term that I see to be a bit broader than what we usually hear either, you know, when we talk or listen to, to some reports on Islamism or fundamentalism. I'm not discarding those terms. I'm only suggesting that maybe uh, Islamic revivalism might be, I don't know whether the uh, widest possible, but definitely a wide term to include all those uh, different uh, groups, movements, and ideologies uh, that certain uh, Muslim groups uh, pursue. So let me move on with my uh, presentation in the time that I have. And first thing that I personally like these things very much when uh, one talks about a particular group of people, whatever that group might be, how big, how large is the group? What numbers are we talking about? And uh, some in the audience may be familiar and may even know me better than me. Uh, others who might not, just for you, uh, what we have, this distribution of Muslim populations in Eastern Europe, uh, the Caucasus, including uh, Azerbaijan, which has some 10 million uh, uh, Muslims or close to that, uh, but otherwise it's part of uh, Russia. Uh, so we have uh, some 15 million uh, Muslims or people of Muslim background in Volga Urals uh, in uh, eastern uh, part, the very eastern part of Europe, you might say, uh, but central uh, part of Russia. It's also uh, around six million Muslims. We're not talking about Russia today. Russia might be talked about as a, you know, uh, an entity of its own in these terms. Uh, it has about 20 million Muslims. Uh, Western Europe has this many. So Russia is an altogether, um, you know, a, a different region, if you want, a specific region. But in Western Balkans, we have also around 6 million people of Muslim background. In Eastern Balkans, their number is uh, significantly less. It's 1 million. Now, when I talk about these numbers or, or these regions, I mean that the majority of uh, people of Muslim background are the so-called indigenous, autochthonous, locals, so or whatever you want. Uh, and you may immediately realize that uh, Northern uh, Europe or uh, the Baltic states, for instance, or Central uh, Europe, Visegrad states uh, are not uh, indicated here. It's uh, for several reasons, one of them being that uh, the, uh, in absolute numbers, the Muslim communities are not as populous as in these uh, four regions that I have indicated, but also that in some of the countries, like for instance, in uh, Central Europe uh, populations, uh, Muslim populations, are not necessarily of autochthonous or indigenous uh, nature. Before I go into uh, the talk of the revivalists or Islamic revivalism in Eastern Europe, this part of Europe, but let me just remind you of the uh, Islam of the traditional groups of 
the autochthonous groups. And uh, I won't go into history, people who are interested in history, the six, seven hundred years uh, history of Islam in Eastern Europe, they may do that. Uh, they may consult uh, research, excellent research on whatever parts, the Balkans, the, the uh, Eastern Europe, uh, meaning um, Poland, Lithuania, Ukraine, uh, that is available in libraries and people can read about this. But just the recent history, the communist uh, uh, history, what we know is that the communist uh, atheist policies throughout the region succeeded to a great degree in secularizing and even what I call agnosticizing autochthonous Muslims to the point where we might say that many, and I am tempted to say most, but because I don't have real figures, I will stop short of claiming that it's most, but uh, it is still many of them, I mean, uh, autochthonous Muslims do not practice any form of Islam and are Muslims by name. And this is very easy to be observed if you go to any part of uh, Eastern Europe to uh, Muslim populated areas where you have mosques in the cities, on Fridays, you would realize that it's just a fraction of people who go to mosques and uh, the majority don't bother to do that. You might say they're busy, maybe they're at work. No, they might be just idling around mosques, sitting at cafes and not necessarily just drinking tea or coffee, but they don't make an effort to go to the mosque. They don't fast and so on. So uh, we might say that uh, the bulk of the uh, autochthonous Muslims have been really successfully uh, taken away from their religious tradition, uh, having become, you know, post-religious, uh, uh, if you want. Um, those who are religious, and of course there are people who are religious, uh, not only among Muslims, but Muslims in particular in Eastern Europe, they tend to practice a mixture, and I'm not suggesting what share uh, of legalist, Sufi, or folk Islam there might be, but you may immediately recognize that their practices, you know, more individual practices, they'd be a folk type, the communal practices might be more of a Sufi, and then, then if it is uh, mosque related or uh, related to official organizations, religious practices, they'd be probably more of a legalist nature, mainly, not exclusively, but mainly Hanafi uh, legal tradition. To many of uh, the Muslims in Eastern Europe, and particularly, of course, autochthonous Muslims, Islam has become a mere aspect of, or, or a feature of their ethnic cultural heritage. To be a Muslim means to just have this uh, heritage, this sort of memory and sentiment towards uh, ancestors who may have been religious, but the uh, contemporary um, populations may not necessarily practice this at all, although they still would identify with that tradition. The younger generation as a rule, and this is what the, uh, uh, the research suggests, are even less religious than the older generation. Uh, and um, uh, the uh, younger generation is more numerous. It's just, you know, simply, uh, sorry, it's, it's, it's the, the older generation is more numerous in this regard, but it's rapidly shrinking. So the, 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 the share of uh, religious uh, Muslims in um, many of the Eastern European countries is actually diminishing. This is what the research at least suggests. Now, so the actual non-practicing of any form of Islam by uh, large parts of the traditional group suggests that they have, in effect, entered the state of what I have already referred to as post-religiousness. Uh, yet, and this is very important, yet it is uh, chiefly the autochthonous uh, Muslims who control and run uh, the local uh, Islamic organizations and the religious properties or infrastructure, the mosques, but not only the mosques. It is also them who, re uh, who are recognized by the respective states as representatives of Islam, and th therefore interlocutors uh, with the state on behalf of the local Muslim communities. Uh, I have just recently written a book on what I call, and I understand this would be a very controversial uh, designation or label, but uh, I call them national Muslim churches. Uh, now, when we look at the revivalists, uh, some of the immigrants, particularly the immigrants, but also converts, and increasingly so, we may uh, also see that, uh, increasingly so, local uh, autochthonous Muslims make the Muslim identity publicly visible through outward signs. Um, for instance, uh, you know, like clothing, hijab and even niqab, something that uh, had not been observed in the region for a long time, uh, may maybe hijab to a certain degree, but certainly not niqab. Niqab is a total novelty in Eastern Europe, as it is, of course, in Western Europe. It's just that in Eastern Europe, the communities have been there for hundreds of years. Uh, many of them, 
of, of, of Muslims and now I include immigrants, Congress and autochthonous Muslims claim to be more religious, um, you know, sort of believing and practicing that their autochthonous uh, religion is as a, as a group, as a you know, total group. And these revivalists, and I'm not going into detail or in typology of these revivalists, and I think Annalise has done this, and this is what you know, is common probably uh, between the Eastern and uh, Western uh, parts of Europe, but uh, the revivalists do not identify with any classical dimension of Islam. What we know is uh, Sunni uh, legal tradition or whatever. Uh, they don't see themselves as being part of this sort of historical uh, continuity and rather adhere to what might be called, not all of them, but tend to be, a uh, majority of them to be uh, uh, affiliated with groups that uh, may be called non denominational Uh, Equinus, I'm not sure if this is the same for everyone, but you seem to be stuck. Maybe turn your video uh, off. They press. Okay, I will try to do that, see if I can do that. Uh, okay, stop video. And if I go back, do, do you see me? Do you hear me? Am I back? Um, I can hear you a little bit better, but your video is on again. So just click one more time on the video off button, please. Hans? Yes, I can hear you. I hope you can hear me. Oh, all right. Okay. Okay. I'm back. I'm sorry. Well, this is, you know, <laughs> someone's playing tricks on me. Anyways, so um, as I was saying, some of the uh, Eastern Muslim, Eastern European Muslims declare themselves to be Salafis. Others sympathize with other Islamic uh, ideologies, including, for instance, Muslim, uh, Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, I see that I need to uh, uh, rush uh, through my uh, presentation and uh, I have now some other technical issue that appears not to allow me. Oh yes, I, I have moved. So these uh, revivalists in Eastern Europe have substituted traditional local authorities like imams and muftis with online and alternative authorities usually abroad, have uh, established cordial relations with global revivalist movements uh, and uh, of course also Western European, have stayed away from mosques owned and dominated by traditional groups or have been dissenting voices in them. And they lately have been uh, founding their organizations, not only religious but also of NGO types and this is related to the regimes of governance of religion, because in some of the uh, Eastern or Central, particularly Central European countries, they may not, or Muslim organizations may not actually be uh, founded as religious. Like for instance, in Slovakia, Muslims can have only uh, NGO type organizations. So this applies to revivalists also. And of course we have some of the Eastern European Muslims who have been radicalized to the point that they would go uh, on what they would consider to be hijra to the Islamic State uh, uh, some several years ago. So what we have is, of course, a conflict and a clash that I don't recognize in uh, Western Europe. And this is where Eastern Europe is different when, we, when it comes to revivalists versus traditionalists. Islam of traditional groups is rejected by revivalists as having become a mere ethnographic feature, thus rendering it irrelevant, an empty shell of what it is supposed to be a true believer. This is how the uh, revivalists would see themselves and how they would perceive the traditionalists. So on the other hand, the traditionalists in return are very suspicious of the intentions of revivalists whom they see more like a threat to their communities, not necessarily sort of as a security threat to the states, but just to their own communities and their Islam. And uh, consequently, they have teamed up with the equally suspicious state well, not always, not everywhere, but uh, we do have these instances to try and check the spread and influence of the revivalist segment, uh, for instance, particularly Salafis, but also Muslim brothers to a certain extent. So what's the challenge? The challenge is that the uh, state uh, and society, of course, also perceives uh, autochthonous Muslims to represent Islam in respective countries. And as long as traditional groups are in control, and they are still, of Muslim organizations and the property, traditional Sunni Islam, inclusive of traditional non-Orthodox forms of religiosity, like Sufi or whatever her heterodox uh, historical forms of it, uh, will continue to be recognized as the true Islam belonging to and uh, belonging in and to the land. This Islam is marketed as European, but very differently from what Annalise was referring to when the revivalists and particularly Islamists uh, also talk about European or pan-European or Euro-Islam. Uh, it's a very different understanding. So the, the, the term might be the same, label might be the same, but the contents is definitely very different. However, if 
once revivalists take over the Islamic infrastructure, this comfortable status quo is to change. And this is why I think uh, our project is very timely because uh, it comes at a very crucial point where uh, we need to pinpoint, we need to map and see uh, what we're focusing on the Muslim Brothers, but probably other projects, including the Salafis, could come at, a, uh, at some point to see where we are heading to, and I cannot forecast, but uh, we'd certainly see a challenge. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention. And, and as I was introduced as someone who has been doing research on uh, Muslim presence in Eastern Europe, uh, there are several titles uh, written by me, and if anyone's interested, you're more than welcome to take a look at them. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Dunas. This was a fascinating uh, presentation and really highlighted this, I think, which is going to be a core challenge for this project, is that when you look at various types of Islam in, in that area, in the CE area, you really have a uh, distinction not only between different groups, but also between communities where the, the actually autonomous uh, communities have a very different type uh, of, of ideas of how religion should be lived, more agnostic, less religious, and then immigrant communities or new converts. So this is going to be a, a very interesting issue to explore uh, on, on how this particular problem could be tackled. Um, I have not seen, up oh, there is one, one question. Uh, let me just see. Um, no, sorry, no, no new question of, uh, that is relating directly to the details of, of your presentation. But again, to everyone who has not done yet or hasn't seen it yet, um, please go down to the bottom of your screen, the Q&A question. There you can uh, get your questions in. Um, um, yeah, then let's uh, move on to my colleague, Victor Such, because the uh, time is a little progressing when we will have, and I, I am rushing on because we do have the question and answer session uh, at the end of all the presentations, and I don't want to cut out too much time from that. Um, Victor is a good friend and works for Globsec as a program manager and research fellow um, with a national security program at the Globsec Policy Institute, so the think tank of Globsec. Well, Globsec, as you know, is, is this big organization in Bratislava that organizes these fantastic conferences. Um, he focuses on challenges related to uh, the changing European and global security environments, mostly jihadi terrorism, and he currently works on the project with Rusi on countering the terrorism financing aspect of this, and of course, on the project with us at CEP on the Muslim Brotherhood, which he is going to introduce the, the first uh, you know, methodological thinking and uh, distinctions now in his presentation. Victor, open to you. Thank you very much, Hans, uh, for the kind introduction. Um, before um, I start, I would like to thank also the research team that has helped me with the with the report. So thank you, Katsper, Egdenas, and Martina Valushekova, who sadly couldn't join us today. Um, and also thank you everyone who could participate in this webinar. So I'll be presenting um, the Muslim, um, the project from the global side of our partnership with CEP. And the project or the publication is called C Activities of the Muslim Brotherhood or CEE Activities of the Muslim Brotherhood. And um, so let me start. Let me first walk you through what I'll share with you today. So I'll start by presenting the five selected countries uh, that we have chosen um, for the research. Also diving deeper into why and how these countries have been selected. Um, then I'll move on to the individual organizations or groups that we wish to study. Talking about uh, also the labeling structure or labeling system uh, we have come up with. Um, followed by our plans how to determine the connections between the studied organizations and the Muslim Brotherhood and finishing off with a with a overview on on data collection. So we selected five countries for our research in order to see the Muslim Brotherhood um, operate in different environments. So we have the Czech Republic, Poland, Serbia, North Macedonia and Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, we know we want to study the Muslim Brotherhood, but how do we do that? In what communities do we look? And Agdonas has sort of already uh, had a preluded into how we'll be looking into this, uh, into this research. So we need two axes to narrow down our search a little bit. On the spectrum of revivalist ideologies, we know that the Muslim Brotherhood isn't a neo-fundamentalist neo group, like Tablighi Jamaat in Pakistan, who do not engage in politics. Neither uh, Muslim Brotherhood in Europe isn't a, a jihadist group. 
uh, who which uses violence as a political tool or tactical sorry tactical tool um, in order to reach their goals we know that the muslim brotherhood is a, an islamist movement and which rallies support bottom up and at a certain point certain point decides to engage in politics as well so the next question was okay now we know uh, this is an an Islamist uh, movement, but where in the CEE context, the Central and Eastern European countries context, uh, where in these societies will we, would these Islamists be? Um, almost all of the study countries have indigenous communities, except for the Czech Republic. Um, uh, but as Agnes has already pointed out, the indigenous communities or the, or the traditional communities um, practice a different, different strands of Islam um, which have been intertwining with the local cultures for centuries and is not um, favored by the Islamists. Also, some of them, as Agnes has said, are turning uh, atheist. So what makes sense to us in the CEE context is to look into the expatriates and converts societies, or co sorry, communities. Um, now we know in the Czech Republic, this is the on these are the only communities um, in Poland, the expats and convert community is actually larger than the indigenous Tatar community. Serbia has around 200,000 uh, expatriates and converts concentrated in and around Belgrade. Um, North Macedonia doesn't have a sizable expatriate community, but uh, we know um, that in the indigenous community have, have struggled to keep revivalist imams away from their mosques. Uh, so we need to take a little bit of a different approach in this country. And Bosnia and Herzegovina is a control case in our research. Here, we want to find out whether the Muslim Brotherhood can establish itself and have activities, or yeah, have activities in a majority Muslim uh, European country. And Bosnia just makes the cut with around 50.1% of Muslim population. But that's not all. Uh, what gives this research a little bit more depth is is the representation of these communities vis-a-vis -vis the state. And now we're talking about the horizontal axis of our research. Um, the Czech Republic and Poland don't have national Muslim, Muslim religious organizations. They do have Muslim religious organizations, um, but none of them have been declared or, or recognized by the state as national ones. Serbia, on the other hand, has national Muslim organizations, but um, one is dominated by Bosnians, which has caused another a rival uh, organization to form. So we have a state of um, a state of competition. Both North Macedonia and Bosnia and Herzegovina have unitary Muslim religious organizations. Um, but the difference is the North Macedonian one had to um, defend the right of, Maced uh, of Macedonian Muslims, uh, unlike the Bosnians, or unlike the Bosnian organization. So all in all, we have a wide spectrum of environments that represent different settings for the Muslim Brotherhood to operate in. And what we're curious about is how, how different will these environments to the Muslim Brotherhood actually turn out to be? So um, we'll probably find different types of organizations in our research. Some groups will, will, probably, will openly meet with the Muslim Brotherhood representatives, but most won't. And is meeting a representative enough to say that a, a certain organization is influenced um, by Muslim Brotherhood? Well, of course not. So what is enough for us, though, is an official affiliation with the Muslim Brotherhood federative body. So that means being official members of a Federation of Islamic uh, Organizations in Europe, for instance. So the formal membership will, will be the base for the first label. The second label is a little bit more complex, uh, but also a little bit more interesting. So here we cannot really rely on a black and white decision, just like with the first label, when it comes to official affiliation, yes or no. Um, so we need to be thinking a bit differently and the tracking of the group's activities or not rather tracking, but perhaps uh, searching for these activities, uh, monitoring these activities will be key here. Uh, we, we plan to analyze a plethora of different activities that we'll find uh, and some of these could be personal ties, funding, ideological support um, and others that uh, Annalise has actually mentioned in her presentation. Um, the last label 
uh, are the gray area groups. And here we intend to include groups that, for which there is evidence that there could be linked to the Muslim Brotherhood, um, but the evidence is inconclusive. So um, essentially we'll use the same process as for the second label, but once we find the data is inconclusive or, or conflicting, um, these, will, the, these groups will end up in the third label when we'll be asking for, uh, for more research or for more information. Um, so the activities of the Muslim Brotherhood and its linked organizations, both in the Middle East and in Western Europe, have been very well documented in the literature. Um, facilitating education, medical services, uh, or organizing conferences and charities are some of the first things that come to mind and have already been mentioned as well. Um, but there can be a lot more of these activities. Um, the movement, Muslim Brotherhood, is known for adapting to um, external, uh, external circumstances, so for, like countries' regimes, uh, which means also that they, their activities are adapting to the, to the environment. So we need to organize this somehow uh, by levels. We chose the religious level, the obvious level, uh, followed by social level, um, which is aimed at which whose like which activities are aimed at at a wider society or a wider community, including even non-Muslims, and a political level. Um, now, making creating a system of adding values to these individual um, activities and setting up a, a threshold with a minimum value to pass for a Muslim Brotherhood inspired organization. Um, would on one hand be perhaps a little arbitrary or on the other hand could be overly complicated. So we decided to stop here and evaluate each activity on its own terms in the context that we'll find it in. The last element is funding. Obviously I haven't mentioned this um, and this will function as a supporting element to the whole, uh, to the whole system because this, will, this is probably going to be the least like or, or the most the hardest uh, information to find the least to discoverable or le uh, least probable to be shared with the research team hence um, we will follow any links we will be able to find obviously for its sensitive nature right so collecting the information will be done in several ways we're planning to conduct a desk-based research until the restrictions on travel loosen uh, during the yeah, uh, during the situation that we are in or at the moment um, in it, in this desk-based research, we'll analyze primary sources such as the group's publications, um, websites, social media posts and others. Um, we'll also try to get our hands on, on court files should a representative of a certain group be on trial, for example. Uh, but we'll also try to analyze secondhand sources um, such as articles in the literature, the academia, um, published by media and other sources. Follow uh, or a supporting element of the data collection will be semi-structured interviews. And we have three groups that we have, uh, we have thought about. The first will be the obvious, the studied group, uh, followed by other Islamic actors in the community. These could be revivalist or not um, in a competing or friendly or a neutral relationship to the studied group, depending on the case. And the last group will be state representatives and experts on the matter. Now, we assume the semi-structured interviews, some of them can be, can be performed uh, remotely, but once the situation with the COVID-19 eases, uh, we would like to, or we, would, we plan to, to, uh, to visit these countries and these communities um, to do a little bit of uh, ethnographic research as well. So what I presented here is supposed to help us guide our research, but can turn out obviously very differently um, once we are on the ground or at the moment researching from our desks. Um, so we expect our methodology to evolve throughout our research. And while it might not be like looking for a needle in a haystack, it might resemble the process behind this puzzle. Um, we know these, how these groups look like, or, or how these groups should look like. We know, how, uh, we know the unique characteristics of these groups, but we need to be able to distinguish them from other revivalist actors. And only then we'll be able to find what we seek.
that's all from me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Victor. I really appreciate the uh, fine Waldo slide I, I told you from the very beginning. Um, it really is a little bit like this. Um, thank you for outlining. To everyone, this is the first of a series of events and reports that uh, Globsec is going to conduct together with us um, and compile together with us in this project. So this is the way that um, uh, the methodology that, that Globsec is going to employ for tackling this different is difficult issue to actually decide um, um, what, what does belong in which category. So obviously this event is also meant to engage you beyond this event. Um, if you have any questions or ideas um, for the methodology, because we are at the very beginning, obviously both Globsec and we are very happy to engage and I'll, I'll tell you how when we are at the end. There is one question I think that, that uh, um, would be quite good to, uh, to, to answer now, uh, Victor. There, there, one of the attendees asked that there are, of course, now a, a range of Daesh uh, ISIL-linked groups in the Balkans. And is there any connection to the Kosovo conflict of the 1990s, or is this a very different radical Islam that we're seeing right now? Um, well, when we talk about Daesh and, uh, and uh, Muslim Brotherhood, obviously we're talking about different, uh, uh, different bodies. One is an Islamist, the other one is jihadist. As far as we know, uh, the Muslim Brothers have not we haven't done the research yet, obviously, but um, what we think uh, there wouldn't be uh, many calls to, to jihad, uh, let alone uh, uh, fight for Kosovo independence. But obviously this is an aspect uh, that we'll be dealing with even in our research, uh, given the fact we are going to Serbia. Um, and the Serbian situation when it comes to Muslims is rather, I would say, complex because we have two different groups. Uh, one is the Serbian group, or sorry, one is a, a Bosnian speaking group and another one is an Albanian group. And as I said, these groups uh, have their own national uh, Muslim organizations, which are in a competing, uh, competing state at the moment. Um, and as Agdunas could probably elaborate even further or sort of hinted at this aspect, in some of these countries, some of these groups are, um, are having, are in a difficult relationship even with the state. And in Serbia, for instance, these groups would be looked uh, with a suspicion, uh, especially also because of, of, of separatist, separatist mo uh, motives. So there's, there's definitely a, an aspect of our research, but I won't compare Daesh to, to the Muslim Brotherhood yet. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate it. And uh, we'll, we'll get to all of the other questions that are in the Q&A window now. Um, when we, we finish the last presentation of today, uh, uh, Dr. Martin Frampton, um, a reader of modern history at Queen Mary University of London. He is the author of three books on the troubles in Northern Ireland and most recently has completed a monograph on the history of the relationship between the Muslim Brotherhood and the West. So exactly what we're talking about today, uh, published by Harvard University Press in, to, uh, Press in 2018, if someone wants to give him a little bit of royalty fees. He also has written on the contemporary challenges of counterterrorism and counter-extremism most significantly with the 2009 pamphlet for the policy exchange, Choosing Our Friends Wisely, Criteria for Engagement with Muslim Groups, and his 2016 paper, Unsettled Belonging, a Survey of British Muslim Communities. Um, Martin, the floor is yours. I'm very much looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Hans. And I just want to check you can hear me. Um, great. Really? Um, this is a very old, uh, set of headphones so I was a bit worried it wasn't going to work um, but thank you Hans and, uh, and thank you to Globsec and Casper and Victor for inviting me um, to, to comment on the paper uh, and on the project um, so I'm just gonna I have a few slides just to kind of guide us along which fingers crossed um, this works okay um, I'm going to try not to, to speak to my full allotted time because I, I want to make sure there's space for full um, questions but it's been great to hear uh, from Annalise and from Agdunas as well. Um, and it's, as I say, my, my brief, if you like, was to kind of uh, respond to um, the paper as it's, as it's developing and the projects it's developing. Uh, and I, I thought it was fascinating uh, to read it. And I'm intrinsically interested in this kind of um, project. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to sort of speak under three headings, really. And the first, I think, is just to kind of offer my sort of encomium really to the project, which is I think the value of this kind of um, endeavor really can't be overstated. This is because it, it allows us to kind of ground our discussions 
in, in hard fact, and it undercuts the kind of conspiracy theory that too often, I think, uh, tends to surround groups like the Muslim Brothers. I mean, in part, I think they, organizations like this bring it on themselves because of their inherently secretive nature. Um, but this is something I think Annalise alluded to in her comments, um, the way in which you have at the moment, particularly in Western Europe, but elsewhere, um, this kind of interplay between Islamism and the far right. Uh, but actually, if, if you're able to engage in a kind of coherent uh, and, and uh, complex kind of mapping process, you can basically cut through that and you can develop a really serious and um, empirical set of arguments for understanding the, the nature of a movement like the Muslim Brotherhood. It's also a value because um, in doing this kind of work, you're taking seriously, um, and this is the kind of thing that I've written for, for Policy Exchange really, taking seriously the, uh, the ethnic, the political, the cultural divisions within Muslim communities. And I'm minded that um, Casper and his remarks stressed the plurality of that word communities. Um, it's taking seriously the fact that, you know, Muslims are not um, monolithic not, and, and, that with, and, and it avoids stereotyping um, and ascribing a kind of singular monolithic identity to them and actually allows us to take seriously the fact that different Muslim groups, different Muslim actors have uh, agency and have agendas and looking seriously at what those, uh, what those agendas are. Um, another reason why this, this project I think has value and, and is sort of intrinsically uh, meritorious is the fact that you know, the Muslim Brotherhood is by definition an international, transnational if you wish, organization um, that has a global agenda. And from the beginning, um, the history of the movement, and it's, and it's as a historian that I speak primarily, um, so you know, the work that I've done looks back really at the historical Muslim brothers. Um, what, from the moment that movement emerged in Egypt, it conceived of itself as having a global mission. Um, and it was interested in building a network um, of supporters and allies really around the world from that time. And you can see that from the 1940s, right? Um, in the formative era of the Muslim Brotherhood, Hassan al-Banna, the, the founder of the movement, created an international section. He sought to build both branches of the, motherhood, uh, branches of the Brotherhood uh, abroad um, and also build alliances with like-minded movements. And he wanted to kind of shape a global sense of Islamic identity. Um, he wanted to build and foster a sense of an Islamic world that he worried was being lost. Um, and it's fascinating actually when you, I was sort of minded when I was looking at this, uh, I tried to find the picture to put on the slide and I, I just couldn't find it amongst uh, my notes. But reading al Khwana Muslimin, which is the, the, the Muslim Brotherhood newspaper in the 1940s, you know, you have articles there um, about Islam in Poland. I remember it being, when I sort of came across this kind of stuff, it being very kind of slightly uh, discordant, thinking, gosh, I mean, why are they interested in this? Um, but, it, but I think it, it, it's serious and it reflects, as I say, this kind of this interest in um, very different uh, Muslim communities. Um, and really that has been the case throughout um, history. So whilst I think the sort of the, the, the uh, central gravity of a moment of a movement like the Brotherhood clearly remains in the Middle East, and in particular, I think Egypt, um, nevertheless, it does matter to it what happens um, abroad. And again, we've, you know, we've seen, um, I think it's been alluded to already, you know, in the 1990s, the Muslim Brothers and of course other political Islamists, some of more overtly violent type, took a strong interest in the Balkan Wars and particularly what happened in Bosnia. And also we've seen key kind of international figures from the, Brussels, from the Muslim Brotherhood network uh, emerge from that part of the world. So I think, for example, someone like the former Grand Mufti of Bosnia, uh, Mustafa Cerich, um, who uh, has been a senior figure in Yusuf al uh European Council for Fatwa and Research. I think at one point he was being talked about as a possible successor to al -Qaradawi. So, So key brotherhood inclined figures have emerged from that part of the world. Um, at various points, the Muslim brothers have tried themselves to kind of build more of a formal structure. Famously in the early 1980s, they, they attempted to create a so-called international organization. Um, on paper, this still exists. Um, but many would argue not much more than on paper, its influence has, has waxed and waned. Um, and really therefore it is, I think, more important to approach the Muslim Brotherhood as a kind of network, which I think it lies at the heart of this kind of project, seeing it as a kind of an interlinking of personal uh, and financial uh, connections built on associations, both familial and financial, 
You know, there is no sort of brotherhood s Comintern or Smirsh going back further. Um, it has, but but there is a kind of a, a sophistication, I think, to the network, and and that again means it um, it is worthy of investigation. That investigation, as I think uh, Victor was alluding to, comes with certain challenges, uh, and certainly one of the most difficult of those, as I say, the nature of the Brotherhood itself. It's, it's penchant for secrecy, um, born of its history, a history that has included severe oppression in many of the countries in which it, in which it emerged in the Middle East. Um, even today, within Western Europe, many of those who are widely understood to be members of, of the Brotherhood network refuse, if you like, to confirm uh, that and prefer to operate uh, on a basis of ambiguity, essentially. So that poses, I think, real challenges for those of us who are interested in serious, rigorous empirical research. We have to be clear on where to draw the lines of affiliation or inspiration or sympathy. But, but I think it's clear that, um, that from Victor's remarks, you know, the project is, is looking very much, looking closely at how to do that. Um, my second slide. Um, and with that in mind, you know, the, it, it, there is obviously an importance here of, of differentiating. And, and the project has, has been described by Victor, you know, looks to operate, looks to identify very different contexts in which the Brotherhood operates in Central and Eastern Europe. And there is a value here in the kind of clusters approach, um, being aware of the different histories and trajectories of local Muslim communities. Um, because again, the history of the Brotherhood tells us that this is an organization defined, if you like, by strategic pragmatism, defined by a readiness uh, to adapt itself to local um, conditions. And that has always been the case wherever it has operated. Um, that also means just in the nature of that, by, by sort of taking that approach, again, we avoid sensationalism, we can avoid kind of crudification, I think, uh, of the brotherhood. Um, and it allows the building up of a serious and, and complex, as I say, sort of inf information picture, if you like. Um, it struck me actually, this is a point um, that, that came to me while Dunas was speaking, that in thinking about the Brotherhood in this region in particular, I mean, Central and Eastern Europe uh, is in many ways more akin to the Middle East than Western Europe, uh, because there you have this clash between longer established traditional institutions and the sort of newer revivalist formations that bear strong echoes really of the situation in much of the Middle East. You know, the clash, for example, of pits, um, again, I'm sort of crudifying it and putting it this way, but you know, Al-Azhar, in Egypt on the one hand against the Iran on the other. So, you know, there's, there's a kind of interesting parallel, I think, in, East, in Central and Eastern Europe that, that mirrors some of what you have in the Middle East that's, that's different from the situation. Um, now, all of this means that one needs to be uh, wary, for example, of differentiating the Muslim Brotherhood from um, other local uh, theological or activist groups. You need to, we need to separate conservative Islam from political activism. We need not to confuse theology with ideology. Um, and we need to treat the Brotherhood serious as a movement with a, with a more or less defined agenda um, of its own. Again, in terms of why this is important, this is because I think it's crucial for governments to make informed decisions about who to engage with. This has been alluded to, I think, by, by both Annalise and Agdunas. You know, one of the things that a movement like the Brotherhood tries to do is to establish itself as a kind of hegemonic force within local communities. Certainly that has been a key mission for it, I think, in the West, um, to establish itself as the interlocutor, uh, the representative of uh, diverse local Muslim communities, and to insist that it is the authentic narrator of what Islam means in a Western context. It's trying to uh, define really what Islam represents and be um, that, uh, that narrator for government wherever you, whatever you think about how governments should approach a movement like the Brotherhood, I think it's crucial that governments uh, have the full picture, therefore, when making their decisions. They avoid false assumptions that the Brotherhood does necessarily speak for all communities uh, and is able to make informed decisions about engagement and therefore the purpose of engagement. And, and again, if there's a kind of theme to some of my work in the past, that's been it really, that governments should um, be serious about the nature of engagement, what they're trying to achieve, uh, and this requires um, a, a full, uh, full understanding of the local terrain. The final thing I'll say, um, and again, I think this is, this is very much at the heart of the project. If I was engaged in this kind of mapping project, what would be the key ingredients? Uh, well, it seems to me these, these four areas are critical really, and, and, and in, in different ways, they're all very much uh, being 
focused on, I think, by this project. On the one hand, ideas, so being clear, uh, again, on the Muslim Brotherhood is defining a particular intellectual space that's, that mocks it out as different from either Salafist groups or quote unquote traditionalist groups or other modernist groups like Hizbut Tahrir. You know, the Brotherhood has a specific sort of set of ideas um, and a set of uh, key concepts that, that make it possible to kind of to identify. Being clear on who the individuals are, and it's again the history of the Brotherhood tells us that, that key individuals have played a critical role in developing this movement and in particular in, in, in implanting its activities in different countries. So in, in the UK where I am, you know, and in the key individual here in building up the Brotherhood initially was, was Kamala Habawi, um, an exiled Egyptian Muslim brother um, who established various organizations which, which continue to exist to this day. So uh, people are kind of crucial. Likewise, activities then, looking carefully at what the, what the Brotherhood is doing. Uh, and a key part of that is always the sort of campaigns that they launch. Um, because again, this is a kind of, I see it very much as a kind of political organization trying to shape ideas, trying to shape the agendas of communities and governments. We see this, for example, in relation to the foreign policy of the EU and Western governments. Um, for example, in relation to uh, how Western governments deal with authoritarian regimes in, in the Middle East, again, Egypt being kind of an obvious example, and of course to Israel Palestine, you know, a big uh, objective, I think, for the Brotherhood has always been to try and shape Western approaches to that conflict. Domestically, um, certainly a big uh, issue that the Brotherhood has focused its energy on recently has been things like the, the campaign against Islamophobia, um, which is not, by the way, to diminish uh, or, un or sort of understate the, the reality of Islamophobia as a problem or anti-Muslim bigotry in, in many Western countries. Um, but the Brotherhood, I think, has sought to leverage that campaign to, again, assert its credentials and assert its hegemony over uh, different communities. The final thing, of course, as uh, Victor says, is often the hardest thing to examine uh, money, but, uh, but crucial nonetheless, because it is the thing which gives Muslim brothers um, huge influence. By and large, they're better resourced than most of their rivals. And in particular today, we see the role of, of a country like Qatar um, in sponsoring the Brotherhood has taken up the mantle of, of, of other states in the past um, that, have, that have lent their financial muscle to an organization like the Brotherhood. So following the ideas, following the people, following the activities and following the money, uh, these seem to me the kind of the essence of any serious mapping project. And it's, it's great, I think, that, uh, that, the, that this project is kind of clearly moving in that, in that direction. So that's, um, those are my thoughts, if you like, in responding to the project and some of what's been um, said today. And uh, I'll stop now.